So how are you? Came, Good. How was the uh, the festival? The festival was great. Uh huh. I mean, you know, um, I tried to get you, but it was just it was it was a hard really? year. Yeah. Well, I think you were just coming back from Telluride yeah. and and in all Toronto. that. And, yeah, in Tor- Toronto was probably yeah. the. I I mean, t- anyway, you know, I just realized it's okay. And then th- and then I remembered this was happening, mm-hmm. so it was this is even better, really. I mean, it, it is. Although it helps, the other thing helps me just keep my my credentials yeah, to, just sure. to get some people. And it, we did talk before the 2014, yeah. and you were very excited about uh, a Godard, the Godard, the Godard. We spent a good amount of time talking about that film, about uh, the Godard film, the 3D film, 3D yeah, film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, continuing on with the talking about filmmakers, uh, yeah. this is a I like I especially like also this is fun for me because to make talk about a movie about movies. Uh, or movie making and filmmaking is is just even more, I don't know, uh, immersive for this yeah. podcast. So that's good. Yeah. So yeah. 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 So yeah. it was. It. How long was this on the menu for you to, to Hitchcock uh, Truffaut? Charles called me. Charles Cohn called me exactly two years ago, and he asked me if I was interested, and I just jumped at it. Oh. And, and there had been a plan to do a movie based on the audio tapes by another filmmaker. Narrative. No. Mm-hmm. No. It would have been a documentary, but a very, very different kind of documentary. Um, yeah. And she passed away. The film's dedicated to her. Her name was Gail Levin. So, Did, you know, he that? called me mm-hmm. and then it worked out with the co-production, you know, yeah. with the pr- French producers. And I just kind of thought through what kind of movie I wanted to make. Yeah. I guess uh, the, the narrative uh, cycle of Hitchcock <laughs> has come and gone. Because there the were a couple of... The uh, cycle of Hitchcock is something that I never even... Yeah. got near i don't yeah. even think i looked at the poster you yeah. know yeah. i mean it's something that just doesn't interest me because you know the way that it was sold okay. um didn't interest me uh right. at all they, well, they, i just arbitrarily mm-hmm. remember anthony hopkins and toby jones is the two right. but but uh yeah. what is it uh that hollywood would get wrong that that they would just totally just miss. I don't think it's what Hollywood would get wrong. I think it's what people get wrong in general because there's a still there's there's an expectation still. Well, it's not even an expectation. I don't think anybody really expects it. So let's call it a reflexive. Um, yeah. You know, it's 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 a, um, a reflexive, habitual way of thinking that all great artists are going to be great, great, tremendous, wonderful, giving people. And then when they're not, time to zero in. Well, I mean, you know, if you, if you watch, you know, if you read Dostoevsky, do you really have the impression that he was a warm, wonderful, kind, <laughs> generous human being? I mean, you know, or D.H. Lawrence or, you know, it's, Ezra Pound. I mean, it's just like... But maybe that, that expectation comes in line with the uh, access to famous people you know in the last 50 years how more and more we expect more and more because they're more available to us well maybe that's levels. true but i mean so now nonetheless you yeah, know yeah uh, i don't know anybody who's unfeelingly perfectly good do you just you, <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, just me but i mean you know I, I and so i think that um in the case of hitchcock mm-hmm. Uh, what makes it particularly egregious is that it's the image of someone who was as overweight as he was, right? Mm -hmm. And as authoritarian as he was, which is something that he shared with almost every director of his generation. I mean, I don't think he was any more or less authoritarian as a filmmaker than John Ford, Um, possibly a little less, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And he... um, the idea that he was, you know, asking Tippi Hedren to service him um, is this, like, you know, grotesque, horrifying thing that mm-hmm. people, that Donald Spoto zeroed in on in his uh, biography. And it is just like, you know, I mean, the history of Hollywood filmmaking is the history of directors with similar relationships with actresses i'm sorry but it's just you know the way it is it isn't now mm-hmm. and that's good mm-hmm. you know but it was and it was just like you know it was a different moment in history and you know you're talking about um you know a guy who he didn't even get one he asked for a blood job <laughs> <laughs> you know 
And that's and so I'm sure it was humiliating and horrible. It was awful that he stifled her career and that he bottled up her contract, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it's horrible. <laughs> and if you read, you know, the stories about John Ford, if you read the stories about Elia Kazan, if you read stories about Nick Ray, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. it's just like you could go on and on and on. Mm-hmm. So is it awful? Yes. Does it mean that he deserves to be singled out and castigated, you know, and held up as an example to everyone of, you know, um, the great, you know, misogynist filmmaker and that we should rethink the way, you know, our admiration of him? No. <laughs> can I, can I, did some of these things come up in those other stories? Like you maybe heard anecdotally that they were more focusing on. I mean, the idea is that we're presenting him as a three-dimensional, flawed, but genius. Uh, yeah. But in, Well... You know, but that's what you're saying. It's reflexive, and it's still kind of getting the whole wrong. Well, I don't. Really, I mean, you know, it, 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 again, it's the idea that he was this guy who, um, and then he terrorized to be Hedron because he made her do multiple takes in the birds. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what yeah. the bird says. I don't know. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like it's there in the script. You know, the birds are attacking her. I, you know, uh, you got to get coverage for God's sake. Yeah, so I, I, I just like you know the idea that that's like some you know, um, all right, crime. I, you know, it d- doesn't sit well with me. Um, uh, it's no different to me than Frank Capra coating his actors' throats with mercury. What did you he know, do? He, 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 I think he coated the backs of he coated the back of Jimmy Stewart's throat with mercury so that he would get the hoarseness in his voice for the end of the filibuster and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And he had people, he put dry ice in actors' mouths so that it would look like there was steam coming out of their mouth for dirigible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, you can imagine what that did to their teeth. Right. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god I hadn't heard them with these anecdotes do you, yeah. do, you, do you read about the, do, you, do you just read a tremendous amount uh, about I've, I've been reading about Hitchcock for most of my life I mean I've Have been you? interested in him most of my life yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know maybe we're around the same age I'm not sure but, but 55 okay I'm a couple of years younger yeah. just a few because I, I just I mean the only theatrical well technically not the only one but when I was a kid mm-hmm. uh, family uh Family plot. Family plot mm-hmm. was, and so like you know, my introduction was in a way. Oh, it's a funny movie, you know, with mm-hmm. like Bruce Dern. And, yeah, with a kind of a Disney side to it. Yeah, yeah. there is a little of that. And then in the eighties, living in Boston, they re-released. The they finally, re-released yeah. yeah, and they finally liberated the greatest American. The five you know, movies. Yeah, yeah. The, those five. So I watched them at the Brattle Theater in Boston, yeah. one after the other mm-hmm. as they came out. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was a nice little turn of fortune. But anyway, so Marty got. When Marty Scorsese saw the first um, restoration of Vertigo in '84, mm-hmm. he met the guy who had done, you know, all the all the prints and the color and you know the timing. And the guy said, "So what'd you think?" And Marty said, "Ah, uh, it's great. You're a good kid. You ruined the color. You ruined the picture. Uh, it's not the same. But you're a good kid. Don't worry about it. It's not your fault." <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. He was just kind of standing there. You know, I mean, the color in Vertigo is so particular. And I've seen uh, IB prints of it, and it's not quite the same mm-hmm. uh, even now. <laughs> <laughs> That's everybody's nightmare, a colorist getting the... Uh, yeah, yeah. It's know. hard. It's hard. Well, the documentary is based or uh, uh, inspired by, obviously, this uh, very uh, well-known book, uh, yep. which is a, a week, uh, which is a uh, kind of a, a spoken word uh it's partly a transcription or uh, about a from conversation a conversation that these two guys had Truffaut between and Truffaut Hitchcock. and Hitchcock for which Truffaut spent a lot of time preparing watching every movie everything. that he could and he, he he did see everything yeah that was available uh stuff like the white shadow wasn't hadn't been rediscovered at that point and it wasn't easy it's not like you know you had Netflix back then <laughs> so that's right it's, it's, it was a lot harder to get prints it was a lot harder to get prints see them and I mean he looked at a lot at the BFI and he looked at a lot obviously at the cinematic process and I mean he made copious notes which we include images of in the that's film that's right I know and he also um those photo montages that he did are um again no DVDs, no home video, you know, you can't go back. And I don't think he was really looking at the films on a cam and kind of like doing the shot patterns. He might have been, but I think he was actually just making notes in the theater and then doing frame enlargements and 
and doing the layouts. And the original layouts that I saw at the Cinémathèque Française are very, very beautiful. There's something I'm, I'm I have I've never mm-hmm. looked at those montages and compared them with the movies themselves to see if he gets it right. I have a feeling he probably doesn't, but that's part of the beauty of it because of the effort to convey how the shot pattern, you know, it's like what Fincher says, he's laying out the cutting patterns. You know? Yeah. Well, Hitchcock was made silent films, right? He made, uh, did not, or was he just on he the, right a few the, silent films. Yeah. 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 What was his uh, earliest films would have been? Hitchcock's first film is in 25. So 25. Yeah. It's shocking. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, yeah, he made, he made a sh- quite a handful of silent films. Yeah. So he is the, he's like the source in a way, like, you know, in other words, people tend to, at least people at a certain age or younger don't realize that uh, just like a lot of filmmakers over the you know generations go to Hitchcock or so or at least influenced by mm-hmm. him. I mean, I guess we hear about it, but until you realize that Hitchcock couldn't have really had any influences, or if he did, yeah, that's uh, right. you know what I mean. So he he really yeah. invented so much uh, that we kind of take it for granted, and he becomes a big yeah. he comes kind of an, like, an icon yeah. anyway. And, an icon. I think that um, the word influence <clears throat> comes a little bit too easily off the tongues of those Maybe. of us in film culture because, mm-hmm. and the reason it does is because Truffaut's generation, Andrew Saras here in America, the filmmakers, you know, of that generation, of the new Hollywood generation, would had that kind of relationship with film history where they were going back and seeing an entire um, all of Hollywood cinema and they were saying and they were reclaiming it and redefining it Mm -hmm. Um, and they were um, seeing this 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 scene that camera movement that you know uh, lighting pattern that um, bit of staging um, and it was exciting them and they were um, as they were uh, taking control of this thing called cinema okay so the um, I was influenced by John Ford I was influenced by Nick Ray I was influenced by Hitchcock's you know um, camera movements I was influenced by Murnau's camera movements that kind of thing the, you're, so you're, it, you're you're speaking. I'm speaking for, of for, people you're, of that generation, sixties right, yeah. and seventies. Right. So some of whom are in the film. Yes, you're, that's you're, right. In your film, Marty, Paul Schrader, Paul Peter Schrader. Bogdanovich, and Peter right. Bogdanovich is a perfect example of someone who really, in yeah. his first few movies, put himself in the shadow of older filmmakers. Yes. Last Picture Show, making black, black and white films for one thing, yes. <laughs> a little, and then also period pieces and. and uh, not only Hitchcock, but also Wells. I mean, we, those are famous stories. Like he was also yeah. But Peter was was as a filmmaker. It's true. I mean, he knew Orson Welles, and he's in the other side of the wind. And yeah. The book of conversations with him. But Peter, as a filmmaker, was putting himself in the shadow of John Ford and Howard Hawks. Okay. That was yeah. that was really what he was about in in the last picture show in particular. Um, I think in the comedies. I mean, you know, What's Up Doc is a remake of Bringing Up Baby. Kind of sure. You know, I mean, it, it's. Then he changed, you know, mm-hmm. he, he kind of, you know, went in a different direction later. But uh, I think that, you know, he's a perfect example of that. John Carpenter would be another example of someone who really worshipped really? Howard Hawks. Okay. Um, I didn't know that. Yes. I mean, I don't you know, think of him in that. Well, prism that's because or, his movies feel nothing like Howard Hawks whatsoever. But I mean, you know, nonetheless, if you read an interview with John, he's talking about Hawks. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis is kind of a you know very much in line with like characters in Hawks' movies but this is the other question about influence because of course when you say I was influenced by mm-hmm. this person and making someone and patterning myself yes. after them you wind up with something always that's completely different yes right right uh, you have to really have a more nuanced understanding uh, yeah. to understand where those influences uh, 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 you know manifest or what happened. that's right like, that's like right. I understand that as a like somebody who was very influenced by certain songwriters when I was writing a lot of songs yeah. and nobody maybe could see it yeah. on the surface until you have a conversation about it and I can give you very specific ways that right. you know which just as it should be I guess so yeah. yeah absolutely I yeah I think uh, you don't, right. you know, you think that you're doing something and you, you 
work at it very steadily and you know um, carefully, but then the final result is something very different. You surprise yourself. Yeah, so and ultimately, good. oh, this is me. This yeah. is my unique voice now. I see it. Yeah. So, so you had to be, uh, I guess, daunting. I mean, to uh, maybe people don't know that, uh, and I didn't. That how that during this conversation, which became a book, mm-hmm. but it was also uh, filmed. Um, no, it wasn't filmed. It was just tape recorded. It was just only tape recorded. I th- oh, and photographed. That's what it is. Photograph. That's yeah. how powerful those images are, though. That my memory, yes. in my memory. I remember seeing the film, which maybe was about a month or two ago. Yeah. I, re- I remember it, that, that somebody was in there shooting film yes. of them talking. That's yeah. just between the audio and the photograph. It's interesting. Well, you're not the f- only one to say that, and I think that that's good. <laughs> yeah, it is what <laughs> because, it is. I mean, I don't know. Well, you yeah. know, I mean, I wanted to make a movie that um, I was, it was the challenge of making a movie with audio of them and photographs only and, and those photographs are pretty well known so I wanted to be very sparing in my use of them and so but it was a challenge that I really was into um, yeah I can't tell you I just watched this documentary for some work I do and um, it was about the gay history of of the city of um, uh, Winnipeg of all places yeah. and um, much of it was archive obviously but a lot of it was also talking heads they had a lot of audio recording and they kept cutting to a reel to reel machine um, player yeah. every time they had an audio recording yeah. it, it, like so much so that I'm thinking you could have probably been a little bit more creative and you, you know in couldn't you have shown photographs a little bit more than just a reel to reel recorder well the so. problem with a lot of documentaries that work from archival material is that they um, they don't what they, they they think oh well we have to keep the audience interested and we have to keep it visual so then you wind up seeing a lot of animation you mm-hmm. wind up right. seeing a lot yeah. of recreations um, of you know events. Mm that are supposedly shot at the time, so the footage is, you know, artificially distressed and made to look like, you know... Um, Vintage. Yeah, right. like 8 millimeter Super 8 or 16 or something like that. You wind up with, like, all these kinds of ways of doing everything but the one thing that really needs to be done, which is to make the movie. And to make the movie means you just take the materials that you have and you, you make them. You bind, you know, you, you make them function by their binding and the tension and the, you know, by by means of binding, t- tension, concision, you know, just putting the movie together. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of movies are made with this with with the same elements, you know, elements that we use: letters, photographs, stills, uh, you know, and footage and interviews. But you gotta. Understand, you got to say, okay, these are my elements. Instead of saying, what am I lacking? I've got to keep the audience interested. That never you, really you works. Had, and you had so much, you had a lot of choices in terms of what you put in over the audio, like in terms mm-hmm. of it could be um, clips. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you had reference points for, for when as we heard Truffaut and, and Hitchcock talking. Yeah, that's true. And, but I didn't want to, you know, for instance, we have production memos of, you know, a lot of movies indicating like where things were shot at different, you know, like Vertigo, there's the memos about the McHittrick Hotel and stuff like that. And there were, you know, memos for other movies, but I didn't want to overdo that. It works with Vertigo because those places are so important in the movie, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, and the mm -hmm. city is so important in the movie. The city of, um, you know, um, Santa Rosa is important in um, Shadow of a Doubt too, but a little bit less so than mm-hmm. San Francisco is in Vertigo. So, you know, you can't, in other words, it has to work in terms of the, the you know, what the film is, what the direction of, the, of our film is, you know, and where it's going. And so we don't, res- we don't have a lot to resort to there are a lot of films to resort to because, I mean, you know, the thing about Hitchcock is that I don't think he ever made a bad film, ever, at all. Well, that's you know, part of the that you know, icon. Yeah, you know, I mean, he of... was great from the start, and he was great at the at the end, and some are less great, but it doesn't really matter. They're all the work of somebody who's engaged um, in what he's doing. You can't say that of you know other bodies of work that big. 
Right. And he, you know, he, it's like anything you, you, you need to see the, 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 the complete package in a way. I mean, it, it works, yes. you know, mm-hmm. to really get, did, did you go back and did, have you seen everything as well? Um, are there a couple of things? I've saved one or two yeah. to not see. I, I know what you mean. Um, you got to have something to look forward to. Yeah, right? you know, I mean, I, 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 I've i never seen Secret Agent all the way through, so I'm looking forward to it. I have it sitting on my, you know, I mean, I, I yeah, you have to have something to look forward to. But then also, I spend my whole life just going back and watching Hitchcock. Yeah. I mean, I've been watching his film since I was 12, and that's when I got the book, I think. And um, I go back and I watch them all the time. My sons want to watch them all the time. How, um, oh, how many sons do you have? Two. Two? And what are their ages? 21 and 17. Really? Yep. So, you know. I guess I, if, so I have an 11 year old. So, yeah. you know, if you were arbitrarily to choose, I guess you have to know your, the kids' taste. I, they I'm started, sorry. you know, I mean, obviously we started watching movies when I was young. You know, it's, it's, it's I mean, when they were young, it's, mm-hmm. it's part of the world that, you know, my world, and I'm sharing it with them. Right. But they were really captivated by him right away. The thing about Hitchcock is that he's, the, the, for a child, it's very, very clear. Is it? It's very, because every, you know, every, every element is very clear. I remember my son, you know, making the distinction between new films that he, where he would go and he would say, I, I, I couldn't tell what was happening versus new films where he was saying everything is very clear. You know, it was very important to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can imagine, I mean, you know, with Hitchcock, everything is 100% crystal clear. Obviously, I wasn't showing them Psycho when they were five years old, but, you know, we were watching North by Northwest, and they found yeah, it very exciting. Yeah, that might have been, maybe that was one of my, that might have been as a child, my yeah. first, or I remember that, and yeah. North by Northwest, and uh, yeah, some of those Cary Grant films. Uh, yes. And or, the thing is that you, as you get older, you see the films, and you, you know, you're young, and they work, and you know, they're, they're very clear, and then every time you watch them, it's another revelation. Yeah. And there's a thing that Marty says in the movie when he's talking about the overhead angles and the high angles and the relationship with, you know, uh, a spiritual, you know, point of view, which I think is quite accurate. Um, when he's talking about Martin Balsam going up the stairs, and there's a distinction there that he's drawing. He's saying, you know, obviously he's going up the stairs, you're hearing Bernard Herrmann's music, you're seeing him, it's, he's sort of like looking around, you know that he's going to get it. That's without question. But mm-hmm. that high angle, you don't expect a high angle. And he's absolutely right. And it's not a matter of like suspense. It's not a matter of suddenly right. cutting to a dramatic angle. Yeah. It's something very different. It's something where um, suddenly you're cutting to another point of view that is um, always there. You know? That's the omniscient point of view. Yeah. The unknown point of view. And that's really always surprising. I mean, it really does. And, uh, you know, I mean, always surprising. Where, For the same reason, the end of Vertigo is always surprising to me. Always. Where does that inspiration come from? That art, That's creativity at its, mo- at its most... It's not creativity as much as it's an, an engagement with um, a sense of something outside of uh, our understanding something outside yeah. of the framework of human life so that you're you know but just making choices like Hitchcock made it's you know which you definitely hear about uh, through their converse, through the conversations of uh, Truffaut and, and Hitchcock uh, mm-hmm. like if he didn't grab it and steal it and borrow it which most people do at least to mm-hmm. some degree. To a degree. Yeah. To a degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, like where, and it doesn't appear, I mean, he came up with these things. And so it, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what you think, where something like that kind of come from. Well, it, often it's called divine inspiration or something like that. No, but that particular Certainly the, idea, that angle you know, is the, the birds, divine one. Yeah. The, the defector and topaz, uh-huh. um, you know, North and Northwest. You're high above when he leaves the United Nations. You're mm-hmm. high above, and you know, and when he's talking about it, well, it's important to get a certain distance because then you don't have to commit yourself to any detail, and you don't have to bother with people taking out fire hoses and showing the traffic on the street. And you're just like, yeah, <laughs> 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 but, 
but there are other ways of doing it than mm-hmm. you know designing a very elaborate high angle shot of the town with the birds you know that he had to work out with Uvi Works you know and, and do the I mean it's just like yes you could do that's true but it's not just functional and it has to do with his sense that there is always a, a an other you know that's that's not a matter yeah. of artistic inspiration as much as it's his uh, his Values extreme or, identification with that. Yeah. It's not Catholicism per se. It's it's something probably learned through Catholicism. Yeah, you know, right? And opening right, opening up, right to to so much more than just what is cinema. It's like you know, yeah. it's allowing in your. Yeah. Yeah, for all your values into it. In a yeah, way. and he and, knows the guilt that people can hold. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he yeah. he, he really—that's why his films are so powerful. You know, immensely powerful. You know what? It, what made the last feature like a talky feature uh, that I was introduced to that through like just happened to have a collection sitting around, and I went through these when he went back to the UK after yeah. those American films. And I saw Frenzy, and I was just, wow, this is really mm. <laughs> him at his. It was the most bizarre film, but compelling as a hell. But it was like his most angry, in some ways, a very, uh, I don't know if it's angry, but it was certainly, I mean, he, the women were uh, quite a target in that. Um, there was a. a yeah, a, but, yes, go women ahead. are a target. But then. I mean, here's the thing, you know, people are focused on the question of Mm -hmm. women now, which is a very important question, but they're folk, but, but it's not, but it's, it's given importance, but then it's a real examination of the question is short circuited by, um, a desire for immediate action. So, you know, I love Michael Moore and I loved his new movie, but when he starts talking about, you know, getting more women into the film industry, it's you're just like, really? That's the answer? That doesn't seem like a good, you know, make let more women make movies? You're like, well, what does that mean, practically speaking? Does it mean, you know, that's social engineering. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes it's not. You're talking about a question that's actually very, very... You're talking about something that's that's obviously very old, and that has to do with um, an expectation that women are going to subjugate themselves and think of themselves in lesser terms, right? Mm-hmm. So, I think everybody would agree about that. But then, when people start looking at male filmmakers of an older generation, A, representing the point of view of a male and thinking, you know, looking askance at that and just thinking, you're a man. Of course you're going to represent the point of view of, you know, of men. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really, what are you going to do? You're going to, you know, check yourself and sort of like, you know. So, um, and then the other thing is that I think, you know, as David Fincher says in the movie, if you think that you can hide as a director, you're nuts. Bad movies are made by people who think that they can hide. It's just elemental to me. And, you know, if you're the whole, you know, Vertigo, I don't see anything sick about Vertigo. What I see is, you know, somebody who's just going deep, deep and not, in fact, freeing himself of like Mm -hmm. kind of obligations and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And going deep into the question of melancholy and someone wanting to just fulfill himself. And he wants to fulfill himself so badly he projects it all into this woman. When the woman dies, he tries to recreate her. He watches her die again. I mean, it's just one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. And it's like Marty says, the plot is completely outlandish. It's absolutely unbelievable. But it doesn't matter. Hitchcock understood narrative is not a matter of plausibility. He understood that perfectly. It's not a matter of logic. If you spend a lot of time you know, logic and plausibility, then you're making a movie like, you know, I'm sorry, but several films that are probably going to, you know, be nominated for Oscars this year. You know, it's just like, it's, it's okay. You know, it's perfectly all right. But I mean, really 
you're putting yourself on the line and putting yourself on the line means risking the kind of thing that we're talking about, making a movie like Vertigo or Frenzy. It doesn't mean that he has it in for women. What it means is that he understands the kind of vehemence and anger and at the same time, simultaneously, the kind of drive that a man can have to project everything onto women. In the case of Vertigo, it's love and, like, you know, saving himself. In the case of Frenzy, it's absolute abject hatred and, you know, wanting to destroy all women. And they're, like, that close, you know. So I think, mm. you know, it's it's terrifying that, you know, one can, you know, feel that, but it's not Hitchcock, you know, saying, I hate women, I'm going to make a movie called Frenzy about a guy who strangles women. I mean, come on, that's not what that movie is. I could talk to you for another half hour easily. <laughs> this is great. Seriously. Well, I'll just say uh, Hitchcock Truffaut, directed by Kent Jones, opens on the uh, the 20th. Opens at the Film Forum in New York City. The film on Forum in Lincoln Plaza. In Lincoln Plaza. Yep. Very good. Uh, both on Wednesday, the 2nd of December. Second of December. That's right. Uh, December 4th in LA. Yeah. Run, don't walk. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, go see this if you enjoy film at all. This is a, um, a must-see. It really is. It's, it's so entertaining, and it's, it gets into the, um, into the nitty-gritty of filmmaking, too. It's, it gets into technique quite a bit more than I thought, so I really loved it. Uh, thank you very much again. Thanks, man.